Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. To hear, when did you first become interested in aviation? Hi, Mike. Uh, you know, my, I, I was born and raised in Pakistan. And uh, it's uh, probably every kid's dream in Pakistan to become a pilot in the Air Force and stuff. But uh, funny enough, I, I came from an Army uh, family. My father and dad was in the Army, an infantry officer, my two brothers and cousins. I had no uh, no desire. I, had no, I didn't know much about the Air Force or uh, air, airplanes. And I had not that burning desire. I saw an airplane uh, fly overhead and that era. So I, by accident, a friend of mine was going to apply for the Air Force. I was only 16 years old at that time. And in the Air Force, they were for a couple of two, three years. They took only after high school, which is, we call it matriculation. So I went with him and I qualified many, many stages of uh, applications. And finally, I did qualify. So it was in 1966. I was born in 49, so I was really uh, uh, 65, actually, that I applied. And I was barely 16. And when I went to the academy, I was 16 years and seven months old. And the minimum wage was 16 years and five, five months. So I just barely made it by the skin of my teeth. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So can you talk us through some of the aircraft you started training on when you became um, uh, or got commissioned to be an officer? All right. So in, the, in, the, in our PF academy at that time, which is in a uh, place called Resalpur still, uh, we had two uh, basic trainers, uh, T6G and the T37. So uh, each course, the first year was just academics and the parades and all the uh, stuff. And, uh, and then uh, the second year in training, you started flying. And uh, at that time, they randomly chose to split our course, our, our, the uh, cadets that we were, in, in two halves. So one half went to T37s, one went to T6G. And fortunately, I went to the T-37s. And uh, not that it would have made any difference because I had never flown before in my life. I'd never even flown on the airliner or never gotten off the ground. But I ended up on the T-37, fortunately, which was, I think, probably a much easier uh, trainer to qualify on. So how long did you spend on your training aircraft before you got posted to a uh, frontline aircraft? Okay, so... <clears throat> We did uh, almost 200 hours of uh, basic flight training in the academy. And once you graduated with this coveted wing, then you went to T-33s in, uh, in, um, in Karachi, in Maripur, a school base. And the, the, so T-33 was basically an uh, instrument trainer. So you had done all... You had done some instrument uh, flying in uh, on the T-37s too, but then T-33 is basically an instrument is slightly heavier, slightly faster jet. And so did, we did about 90 to 100 hours of uh, T-33. And then some people, <clears throat> some uh, pilots, they, from there they, they would go to the helicopters or to C-130s or, uh, or you know, be boarded out. And some went to uh, for uh, fighter training on the F-86 to uh, Peshawar, where number 14, uh, number 26 got in Peshawar. And uh, we did about, uh, I think, 100 and, 120 or 100, something like that hours on the F-86. So they, and that was basically uh, fighter training, basic fighter training. Yes, and as our viewers and you know, we're here to talk uh, for half of the interview about the F-86, which was you on the ENF. So what were your first thoughts of the Sabre when you saw it up close? You must have thought, this is cool. So, you know, like I said, I didn't know much about fighter airplanes or the Air Forces before I joined. But after I joined the Academy and, and 
And not to be boastful, but believe me, when I started flying, flying came naturally to me. I just, you know, kind of adapted to it very, very quickly, and I loved it. And so for every young man at that time in the Air Force or not, the F-86 was for Pakistan Air, Pakistanis and Pakistan Air Force was the the iconic airplane the, the, because we would be to war with India just recently in 1965 and 86 they performed very very well we had a few heroes to talk about and so uh, I was you know really looking up to uh, the F-86 and uh, so when the first uh, you know, up close in uh, personal with the 86 I just it was an awesome airplane fantastic machine and with the uh, three guns on each side, three barrels over there, and and it is there's something about the F-86 that uh, was striking, and I just of course I had fallen in love with the airplane even before I started flying, but after I started flying it more so, and uh, uh, we did, we did basically basic uh, uh, high and low level uh, uh, combat formations, uh, and then tail chases. A bit of uh, air combat maneuvering, air to ground, uh, work strafing, rocketing, and skip bombing. Now that that I'm talking of 1968 or early 69. So I was barely 20 years old, and you know when you when you started doing skip bombing, for example, we used to do skip bombing, which is napalm, which finally later on got uh, uh, prohibited. But we used to practice it 35 feet off the ground at 420 knots. So can you imagine a 20-year-old kid in an F-86 going 35 feet off the ground on the, on the firing range at uh, 420 knots? Now that is amazing, amazing experience. Absolutely. So to hear, what was the role of the actual Sabre in um, the Pakistan Air Force? Because it sounded like it did it all, train it air to ground, air to air, but was it dedicated to one role more than the other? Yes, uh, See, now the trainer in uh, number 26 squadron, which is basic uh, fighter conversion, they used to call it, fighter conversion school, that was on the F-86 F models. Uh, they were ex-Korean War airplanes, uh, American built with the leading edge automatic slats and everything, standard F-86. So we had, we had a fairly large number of Canadair built F-86Es, which we call them Es, and these were slightly more powerful Orenda, Orenda engines, uh, Canadian engines, slightly more powerful engines. And uh, uh, so we, that was the mainstay of like our air to ground or uh, for ground support uh, thing. So w- once, once I finished uh, the basic uh, training conversion onto the F-86, then I got transferred to, uh, to Karachi to F-86 E squadron, number 19 squadron, and that was basically a ground attack squadron with limited uh, air uh, defense capability, because we had uh, we had mounted uh, uh, side riders on our 86s, uh, the AIM, AIM 9Bs, and uh, but basically it was a uh, army support, ground support uh, missions, and they used them extensively for that. The Orenda engine gave it uh, some extra boost. It was notorious for you had to be very careful. If you're from very low power setting or idle power, uh, if you advance the throttles quickly, the compressors stall. So, and I had one nasty, nasty experience with that. Learned from that. And uh, but uh, that that's the role of the F-86. We had a whole lot of them at that time. I don't know the exact number, but uh, this could have been excellent. Yeah, we'll get into a bit more detail about the F-86, but just backtracking a bit here. Uh, being obviously a U.S. Air Force aircraft, did you have any American personnel to train you on the aircraft, or was it all done in-house? All done in-house. By the time I got on the F-86s in uh, 69, early 69, my first uh, F-86 squadron, you know, we had bags on experience of experienced pilots on the 86. We had been operating them, I think, since the... Mid fifties, wow. Um, some, some, uh, yeah, because you know the ex-Korean uh, War airplanes oh. came to Pakistan. So around, I, 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 uh, I think it's what 55, 54, 55, We had been operating the F eighty sixes. So we were one one air force that were really experienced on the A sixes. Absolutely. 
And obviously, um, in your time, was there any sort of simulator, obviously, in your training phase, or was it just basically all book work and then jump in and go? We had, they used to call it a link trainer. It was a really funny contraption, you know, uh, it's just a basic instrument trainer, actually. No no specific trainer for the F-86, if you ask Mm -hmm. me that. Mm -hmm. The the first flight was a solo flight, with the with the instructor chasing you, and that was also remarkable. It speaks very highly for the instructor because I think just a handful. You got a kid sitting in a F eighty six who's never flown the airplane before, and by himself, and you're chasing him and telling him, "Okay, no up and talk to him right, and especially to make him land the first time." Must be a handful. I've not done that. Yeah, so I want to talk about your first uh, flight in it. Like, were you? Sweating buckets at the time when you had to walk out to the aircraft and thinking, "Oh my God, this is real now." I must have, but I don't remember. I, right. I must have been very, very excited about it and anxious about it. And uh, uh, but I think you know they they put you through all that training and all that stuff. And fortunately, I had a, a very, very kind and very able and very young, actually, maybe he's just five years older than me, instructor to teach me the F-86. I'll plug it in, flight left in Sarfraz. God bless him, he's passed away. And, uh, you know, it was, I wasn't, I must have been very excited, but I don't remember sweating Mm -hmm. too much. (laughs) Well, I would be, I know that, but... uh... Yeah, so on the takeoff, uh, could you uh, feel the power difference coming from, you know, the trainer aircraft like the T-33, T-37? Big time. That that was, especially the T-33 was such a lumbering, slow, underpowered airplane and with these huge, big tip tanks. So on the 86, uh, what we used, they used to do is the instructor, who I, I, you know, I've got a lot of regard how they used to train us on the 86. So they used to have a, a, a safety belt these two, after they've, you know, you've learned everything about the airplane, about the checklists, about procedures, startup and all, done it a few times. And then the instructor used to hang on, stand on your wing route with one foot in the step with a safety belt around him hooked onto your windowsill. So you taxied it out onto the runway. You open par, not to max par, with the canopy open, and then you release brakes. And you started rolling, maybe go up to about 18 knots or so, and then brought the throttle idle and stop the airplane. That was, we used to call it, the, before you actually take off, that was like a, we used to call it a high-speed taxi or whatever, on the runway. So you stop the airplane, and the instructors hang over there. And uh, then you came back and shut down. So the next uh, trip was actually your takeoff. Of course, you felt the power, big uh, time power deficit because you hold brakes, up to a certain RPM and then let go and the airplane used to like uh, plug forward. Beautiful, absolutely magnificent. Yeah, so let's talk about um, how the aircraft handled and what did it do well and not so well? The 86, I don't remember anything that was adverse in its uh, characteristics, which I realized later on, you know, I got more experience about it in a few other airplanes. I can't remember anything really adverse about it. It was just a magnificent airplane to fly, very forgiving. The only thing I would I think back now, either it was by design or by the time we started flying the 86s, the airframe uh, had a lot of wear and tear on it. Our max Gs in uh, air combat or something was limited to five Gs. And that, although the airplane could easily uh, pull more Gs depending on the speed and all, so that I thought was a bit of a limiting factor. Uh, other than that, adverse characteristics in its uh, flying was there was nothing at all about it. Very forgiving. You would uh, stall it. You would in a turn. You could get in an accelerated stall. It wouldn't like some of the other straight back airplanes do an adverse yaw or flick over. No, nothing like that. Beautiful okay. airplane. That's pro- yeah. That's what you want as a pilot. A forgiving airplane, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about some of your training um, you would conduct. You briefly mentioned it before, but was it half fee half? Was it air to air half, and then air to ground, or air to you know uh, reconnaissance? Tell us about that. Your training in the F eighty six. Training F eighty six was basically uh, there was no air to air. 
it was only uh, in uh, you know when we were converting it was only uh, high level and low level battle formations advancing on to tail chases to just to get to know the airplane better and to throw the airplane around so that ins- instructor would be in front and would have to you know keep up with him uh, maybe uh, between 300 uh, feet to 1000 feet behind him and he even was he throws it around so you get comfortable with the airplane and then advancing into basic combat maneuvers like you know a, after the tail chase a quarter attack and you turn into a heavy yo shoot and you reverse yo yo's high speed low speed yo yo's and uh, stuff like that and uh, so uh, basic basic combat maneuvers and then uh, later on we used to start doing some one versus one uh, air combat and then some basic two versus two maybe four or five uh, flights of two versus two where you are uh, on a fighting wing position to uh, to your leader and you just maintaining the position and keeping his tail clear and so that stuff very exciting stuff then mostly it was air to ground and uh, we used to do uh, strafing on the, the range was very close to our base <clears throat> in peshawar and we used to do air to ground strafing six guns we should normally use just two of them uh, for practice purposes and that was very very nice uh on, on targets uh, and then uh, the rocketing we used to do basic rocketing i think we had uh, 68 mm rockets we used to fire some rockets just to see how they land and uh, some a bit of dive bombing on the on the range and then the heaviest in the funnest part was the skip bombing at 35 feet and 420 knots and that was awesome wow yeah it sounds like a i mean that must have been a lot of fun doing all that stuff in the save i mean as a young man that must have been pretty cool <laughs> absolutely so i want to talk about the cockpit what was that environment like as a pilot f6 cockpit i think was a very uh, ergonomic kind of cockpit you sat very high which in you know rich spec when i uh, think about the the mig 19 or even the mirage that i flew later on the the visibility from the cockpit was almost like in the f16 that i uh, never flew or which i did and uh, so that was one big big advantage you could turn back uh, crane your neck and you could see uh, the the fin and uh, or, so that that was a fantastic uh, advantage and he sat pretty high you know a short guy like me that was a big advantage uh the the cockpit itself was a very very nicely laid out cockpit basic instruments the um, you know old style instruments but very very good nice so do you think uh, the aircraft was right for the pakistan air force at this time perfect absolutely perfect airplane for us it was a main steer for airplane it was a cheap well cheap to acquire cheap to maintain and uh, i i think that was the airplane uh, very very good choice i don't know if he had a choice at that time but who so made that choice was very very good and it's a beautiful aircraft of course i say absolutely yeah. absolutely even till today oh absolutely yeah up there with the hawker hunter and um yeah i just want to ask you you probably have lots here to hear but uh, do you have any memorable stories you can share with our viewers that stick out in your mind on the FA6 yeah so, yes uh, okay one story is uh, you know i was uh, i had more than my share of uh, incidents and things happening in my in my uh, air force career so i was uh, talking about the orenda engine the canadian engine so it had i think the problem was in the f- uh, first two stages of the compressor whatever so They, in, when we converted onto the uh, F-A-6E with the Canada airplane, so they told us, okay, be very careful when you advance, unlike the F-A-6F, uh, when you advance from low pass settings or idle pass settings uh, in the air, to uh, be careful, don't uh, do it fast. Of course, we had kept him. So one time, we, we had an exercise going on on the base, and with the Army gunners and ACAX and all, everything deployed, So I was I came in and you know the usual traffic pattern you come over the runway and you pitch out and there's a mobile control we call a mobile control it's a pilot sitting there with the binoculars and all so as I turn base you pitch out and you come uh, make it base turn to land 
So I saw my uh, uh, landing gear, my left main landing gear was indicating unsafe. I didn't have three greens. So I had two greens and a red on the, right, on the left side. So it was indicating the main wheel was up. <clears throat> so of course I, I uh, told the mobile, I said, okay, I've got uh, left uh, main gear uh, indicating unsafe. And I could also feel it a little bit that it's not gone down. So I had to come down and make a kind of a low, lowish uh, go around so that he can confirm, yes, your gear is partially up or fully up or whatever. But being young and foolish and, you know, like uh, I was a uh, uh, hot rod, so I came down a bit too low, maybe about 100 feet or so, and I opened the par rapidly. And as I opened par to go around, the compass is stalled. Now I'm just about a hundred feet off the runway, the compass is stalled. So, you know, as I pulled the power back and I had no choice but to land. So I landed on the runway with this left main gear up, which I knew was up. So I quickly tried to land on the right side of the runway. And before I knew it, you know, it, uh, kind of the left wing dragged on the thing. I skidded sideways for a bit and off the runway in a huge dust of uh, cloud of dust. Came to stop. It didn't catch fire or anything. I jumped out of the airplane. I said, "Oh my God!" So you know. And then my uh, uh, OC wing came in a jeep. You know, somebody told him, "Oh, this guy forgot his gears or something." He came running for it. But anyway, so that was my first incident on F-86. Wow. Lesson learned. Uh, but uh, I'm sorry that I, uh, I, I think they put the airplane back in service. The wing had very little damage. And they uh, put it back in service a few days or weeks later. Absolutely. And later on, we'll hear that um, Tahir actually has nine lives with uh, what's happened to him in, over his career. <laughs> and it's great for him to be here. But uh, yeah, so Tahir, how many hours did you get on the F-86? 86, I think all included must be just under 450 or 480 hours. Yeah. It's quite a bit. <laughs>